running a little bit late. I have a lot of slides, so I'll try to go really fast through them. Uh, I promise I'll do my best. Uh, so, hello. Uh, that's going to be a tough act to follow, but I'm going to up Godfrey's game. So, I ordered a MacBook selfie stick. <laughs> Too bad I didn't, I didn't get on time for the talk, but I'm sure this one works. I'm not that like Godfrey's selfie stick, he had to use his fingers, so what was the point, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, ho I hope this is going to be interesting. I'll let you know how it goes. Too bad it didn't ever have time. So now let's get into the talk. So the name of this talk is When Making Money Becomes a Headache, Dealing with Payments. Uh, my name is Sebastian Sogamoso. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Seba Soga. I work at Ride, which is a company uh, where we build the best app for carpooling. You should check it out, ride.com. Uh, I also co-organize a Ruby conference in Colombia, where I li live. Uh, you should join us there. It's, uh, it's going to be in Medellin, which is a pretty cool city. Uh, we are currently receiving proposals, so you should check out CFP and send proposals, uh, but after this talk, not right now. Okay, so now let's get into the talk. This talk is going to be about trust, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by trust. So it's about having trust from your colleagues, uh, having trust from your company and more importantly, having trust from your users, having your users trust you. And how do you do that? Well, you do that mainly in two ways. First is keeping your information safe, and second, keeping your app free of bugs, basically. So in this talk, we're gonna focus on the latter. Uh, and this is how your users trust look like. And then if you have a bug up here, the trust diminishes. If the bug is really big, it diminishes a lot. <laughs> uh, so for example, at Ride, if we have a bug in our chat service or geolocation service, trust is uh, really affected and it, it diminishes considerably. Uh, but if we have a bug in it, like you know, traffic updates or weather updates or in, with, with reminders, trust won't be that affected. It will certainly suffer, but it won't be that bad. On the other hand, if we have bugs related to payment, our, the trust of our users in our app goes really down. Uh, it goes, I mean, yeah, it's really affected. It goes down to almost zero. Uh, and this is really bad because, like, users can, al can also disappear, can just, like, stop using your app, stop, start trusting you at all, which we don't really want, right? So in order to prevent this from happening, I want to talk about some common pitfalls I've found when working with payments uh, that I found myself uh, dealing with or that I've seen others struggle with too. So uh, let's talk about them. The first one I want to talk is related to payment gateways. So uh, a lot of people think that when you make a request to a payment gateway, the status code of the response, the response is basically telling you if the transaction was successful or not. So we, a lot of people think that the status code of the response correlates to the result of the transaction, and that's not true in a lot of cases. So I'm going to show code during this talk that it's mostly over simplified examples I know they may seem a bit dumb, but I'm trying to make a point, so bear with me. You'll, you'll see why. So let's say we have a transfer class that uh, creates a transfer in a payment gateway. So that class also checks the status code of the response to decide if the transfer was successful or not. When using that class to create a transfer, we might end up introducing bugs. And that's because by trusting it, but by trusting it will tell us if the transaction was successful. Some operation, uh, some operations such as money transfers, take some time to be settled. 
And with time, I don't mean like a few minutes, a few hours. They take up to like a few days. So if you make a request to your payment gateway to create a transfer and then you get a response saying like, yeah, you have a 200 code and you think that means that the transaction was successful, you might get a surprise. Because like what, how a lot of payment gateways work is that only until later, you, they will let you know if the transaction, if the transfer was actually successful or no. At their own time, they will let you know. And normally they do that uh, via web callbacks, which are very known as webhooks. And they will let you know that way the result of the transaction. And they will keep sending them until you acknowledge you got the message. Or until they, they just like reach the retry limit. Uh, but this is normally, this, this is something that I've seen people struggle with, uh, not being aware of uh, checking for the actual result of the transaction via webhook, webhook, sorry, which are asynchronous. So uh, there's some important thing that I've seen a lot of people also like not consider when uh, exposing, exposing an endpoint to a third party service such as a payment gateway. Uh, you have to think about security. So when you're exposing a, a, uh, an endpoint to a third party, the best way to make it secure is to add authentication to it. But sometimes some payment gateways don't support that. Uh, so another, like one thing you can do in those cases, if possible, is just like get the event ID from the payment from the payload the, pay, the payment gateway sends you. And instead of processing the data you get there, just like going back to the payment gateway, fetching for the data based on the event ID you got. Okay, so now I want to talk about another thing, which is uh, operations. And it, it's, it's a really not, it's a co really common problem that uh, it comes when dealing with payment, with money transactions, sorry. So we fail a lot about at making sure that they are item potent. So Let's look in code what that really means. Uh, so basically in code, that's the difference between the method on the, on the, at the top, which basically charges an invoice every time it is called, and the method at the bottom that only charges the invoice if it, has been, if it hasn't been charged before. In other, in other words, the code at the top, right there, will charge the invoice 10 times, but the code at the bottom Oh, so the code at the bottom will only charge it once. So this might seem like a really small thing, but there are a bunch of companies that have, have dealt, dealt with bugs when they have overcharged users, charge them a lot of times, even taking their, their users' accounts to overdraft, which is, a, which is terrible, uh, with, with something that can be dealt with really simply, it's, it's, it's like a really uh, basic concept that we forget about a lot, of a, lot of, yeah, a lot of times. So just keep it in mind. Another common pitfall I found that people deal with uh, that I want to touch here is tracking payment history. So this is key for stuff like accountability, like uh, be, being able to deal with support requests from your users, even debugging. So you, you start to get questions uh, when looking at the code or, or the records in your database, like how does this record get into its current state? Or what was this record state at some point in time? Uh, and the problem is that it's usually hard to know which code led to a specific state change or uh, if the data, I mean, if the if current state uh, if, if the current state was overridden, or if the code that led to a state change is not there anymore, it was removed or it changed. So a, a pretty good way, way to deal with this is recording events every time there's a state change. So after you start recording events, every time you change the event of a record, you 
sh you need to be really uh, like strict about never going back and updating those events because that would basically undermine the whole purpose of doing this. So getting more practical, there are two ways of doing this. So one is pretty simple. One alternative is using something like a gem called Paper Trail. I don't know if you know it, but it, it's basically magical. It's you just hook it up and it will take care of, of a lot of this for you. But it might not work for your specific needs, so you can run with your, with your own custom solution for this, um, and maybe doing something like event sourcing. So let's say you have a charge class that has many events, and those events record record sorry, uh, and re record such a, stuff such as like the type of event, the relevant data for that event, and then you have an order class. And that order, when being charged, creates a charge record and, it co and its corresponding event. So then, after you create the charge, you send it to a payment gateway. Once you send it to the payment gateway, based on the response for the payment gateway, you will also update the charge and update and create a new event based on if it was successful or not. This way, if later in time a user complains about why they didn't they get their money uh, or why uh, a charge failed, then you can go in, into your database and check where, which events are related to the charge the user is complaining about and find out what, what, what went wrong or what was going on at the time. So we just saw three really common pitfalls when dealing with payments. One was one was related to the payment gateways, the other one was about how to track history, like state changes for your payments, and also how to make operations item bold. So this may seem like boring work, like something that you don't really want to deal with, so I have great news. And speaking after Godfrey, which is who is a Rails core team member, I was worried that he would break the news before me. And is that Rails 5 <laughs> will introduce a new module called Action Payments. Well, that sounds boring. It should be called Turbo Payments. So now that we know there's a magical solution to all of our problems, let's get serious again. Uh, we want to keep our users trust like this, right? And to do that, and well, I mean, basically that's really important because we have to realize that payments play a huge role in the user experience. Uh, if you are mostly focused on backend, as I am most of the time, you think that what you're doing, the code you're writing, is not really related to user experience. We normally think that user experience is something that people working the front end uh, is dealing with or responsible for, but that's not really true, especially with when talking about payments. So I want to present five ways I consider that you can provide a good user experience in regards to payments. So they are doing asynchronous transactions, giving users payment status visibility, allowing them to delete their payment information at any time they want, being able to seamlessly deliver big changes, and being effective at dealing with bugs, which is the hardest one. So we'll leave it for last. So let's review the first one. Uh, again, before we go into this, I'm going to show oversimplified versions of code. Bear with me. I'm trying to make a point. So let's say we have a charge controller, charges controller, and every time it gets a request, it creates a charge. Uh, what this method is doing in particular is going to the payment gateway uh, to create a charge right there in the controller. So then it returns true or false, a Boolean basically, based on the status of the result of the transaction in the payment gateway. So on the surface, this seems to be 
pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and it, lo it's, it, it looks like this is what's going on. Basically, a user makes a request to your system, and then your system goes to the payment gateway, and then they all go back with a response. Cool, simple, right? But this is what really happens. It's not as simple as that. So once the request gets to your application uh, and goes to the payment gateway, the payment gateway goes to something called the payment processor, which is like where all the heavy lifting related to payment is done. And uh, the payment processor then goes to the card franchise and checks for like, I don't know, you know that the number is valid, that the security code is valid, and stuff like that. So it goes to talk to Visa, to Amex, or to MasterCard, companies like that. Then after, if your card is validated there, it will check that you have funds. So it will talk to the issuing bank, the card, the bank that gave you the credit card, debit card even. Uh, if you have funds, then it will go and connect to your merchant's bank, which is basically the bank where you get your money deposited to. And in case everything's good with your merchant's bank, then it, it will go back, all the way back to the payment gateway, to your system, and eventually to your user. So what happens here is that you let your user hanging for a while and something might go wrong at that point. So there's a big chance that you're giving your user a bad user experience. So how can you deal with that? You can change that implementation to an asynchronous one. So this is something that you should do whenever possible. It's not possible all the time, but it's possible most of the times in my experience. So in code, being more concrete about it, uh, how would that look? So basically your controller would now, now look like this. Uh, you would, when you get the request, you would schedule a job to be executed by another process in the background. Um, this is, it has a lot of benefits other than just not uh, like leaving your user hanging there. So one is it makes really easy to retry uh, charged fails. So for example, if your worker looks like this, uh, by adding a background job processor such as Sidekick, uh, you will get free retries and Sidekick even allows you to specify how many retries you want to have. And uh, the good thing about it is that even if after retrying, for example, three times here, uh, like the job won't get lost. It will just like go to a dead job queue where you can recuperate it later and deal with it. So now let's move on to the second point I want to talk about. So it's payment status visibility. So when dealing with payments, you'll get a lot of questions or requests from users asking like, why don't I see a refund in my card statement? Or when am I getting paid out? Or why was I charged $10 for? I just saw the charge in my bank statement or my card statement. So having a place where users can go and see the payment history will help you deal with that and keep your users happy. So you can have something like this where you can go and see the trip you took and how much you were charged for it. The more transparent you are, the more trust you will have from your users. Okay, so moving to the third point, which is deleting payment information. This might seem trivial, but it's not. Uh, you need to give users full control of their payment information. Otherwise, they feel like it's like you're, you're leading them to a trap where you're just trying to gather payment information and then not allowing them to leave, which is terrible. So giving users uh, full control of their payment information, uh, such as like deleting the payment methods whenever they want, it's a good thing to do, and you can just uh, like have a really simple and naive implementation when, whenever a user makes a request to destroy a credit card, you just go and wipe it from the database. Uh, that's good, I guess, but you should also consider that if you allow users to do that, uh, you might be allowing them to like get out of 
get out of your application with pending charges or even leave you with no way to pay them for money you owe them. So instead of just like going ahead and deleting uh, payment information right away, you can do stuff such as uh, checking if they have payment, uh, yeah, sorry, checking if they have uh, pending transactions and settling them first. So you could just like do something like checking if the accruing user, for example, ride, ride has pending trips to be charged, and if it does, uh, like charging them, and then deleting the card, in case you can delete the card, like letting the user know like, hey, uh, I really want to delete your card, but I can't because you have stuff pending. Okay. So, going to the fourth point, uh, is let's talk about how to prepare to ship big changes seamlessly without affecting your user experience. So, there are a few ways you can make that easier. The first way is discussing big changes. So. This is too general, too broad. So there are a lot of ways to do this. And I want to talk about how we do it at right. We create RFCs. So RFCs stands, RFC stands for uh, Request for Comments. Uh, and what we do at Write is to basically create like an open document where everyone gets an amount of time to comment on. Uh, so basically, they can give you feedback about what you're pro the changes you're proposing. So what we generally do is explain what we want to do, the overall intention of it, and then focus mostly on how ch the change will affect other like other parts of our system. Uh, RSCs are not like an invention of us. They've been uh, they existed for a long time. They have worked really well for open source, and they work for us too. Uh, another way you can uh, deal with uh, like ship big changes seamlessly for your users is to be prepared to uh, by making changing stuff easy. So let's say this uh, big circle is your like billing code. So there you have uh, business logic and like payment gateway code mixed up, and as you can see. I mean, maybe you can't, but that's why it's tried to represent there, is that this code is uh, tightly coupled. So there's there's a lot of coupling between the payment gateway code and the business logic. So the first thing you might want to do is to, to, to prepare to like make big changes is to separate them, basically. So breaking the coupling so that you can end up actually kind of extracting your payment gateway from the business logic, that will allow you to, for example, in the future, like st stop using a payment gateway and just plug another one, or switch based on the location of your users, or uh, I don't know, in whatever weird, weird business rule the market you're operating in has. Uh, and this is how all of these circles Good looking code. Again, it's an oversimplified version of it. So let's say uh, you have a charge class that receives a payment gateway every time it's instantiated. Uh, that will allow you to use doc typing uh, to introduce as many payment gateways as you want, as long as they follow the same contract. So basically, you could use the charge class with one payment gateway or the, or the other, and they should work the same. They should be, you should be able to seamlessly replace one with the other. Uh, so another thing you can do is to simulate billing. This has been really useful for us or at, at Ride because like, we have tests, we test our code, we have unit tests, we have bigger tests that uh, test, for example, all of our billing flow. But still, sometimes we want to make sure that changes that we did uh, how changes that we did will actually run in production, how they will uh, affect our users in the real world called somehow. So uh, having a way to simulate that, is, it's really useful before running, before doing real transactions in production. 
So we use the sim we use like our simulator in production, not in like in development and QA where we just have like simulated environments to basically see how billing will behave. Uh, this is useful for debugging problems that we already have or to see if a new feature we introduced uh, is going to break something. So building on the steps we just followed, like by extracting payment gateway to make change easier, uh, we just basically introduced another payment gateway, which we call simulation payment gateway. So again, using that simulation payment gateway instead of like a real one, uh, you can just basically uh, log everything that will happen, that will be sent to a payment gateway and see if it, if what it's actually doing is what you expect it to do. So that allows you to basically just replay the payment gateway with a simulation one, run your code, and check that everything behaves how you want it to. So last but not least, let's talk about dealing with bugs. Uh, there's no shame in, accept in accepting that we create bugs is part of building software. Building software is a human process. We're humans, we're not perfect. So this will eventually happen and we have to be prepared for it. The, the sooner we accept that we're gonna eventually hit building bugs, the better we'll be prepared to deal with them. So. Uh, What's really important is that you catch them quick, uh, even before your users n notice it, notice that they happen. So this is really important to keep your users' trust in good sending, uh, because if you are, yeah, sorry, because if you are proactive about it, uh, they, I mean, your your trust won't be affected as bad. But we will talk about a little bit about that later. So. Uh, how can you cap catch your bugs quickly? So uh, one good way to do that that has worked well for us is basically monitoring and alerting. Uh, so for example, I'm going to show you just some pseudo code. So if you charge, if you create a charge whose amount is bigger than a thousand dollars, you want to alert everyone because that's something that shouldn't normally happen. It might not be a bug, but it, it very likely is. Uh, another thing you can do is like, for example, if, at right, if we charge a user for a specific trip more than once, send an alert. That shouldn't happen. We shouldn't charge someone more than once for the same thing. So that's, that's very likely to be a bug. Uh, we want to know about that as soon as it happens. Uh, and you need to have uh, like, what I like to call a damage control plan. So when bugs happen, you need to have three things on that damage control plan, or three things to be prepared. So the first one is communication, which I really talked a little bit about. And you need to have like clear communication guidelines. How, who is in charge of approaching users? How are you gonna approach them? Well, what's the best way? Like how long are you gonna wait for them to respond? If they don't respond, and what do you do? And stuff like that. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, be proactive, reach to you, the users that are, were affected for, uh, by a bug before they reach out to you. Uh, that's really important. And then like internally, write up a smorten. So this is something that you can do after the, like the bug was contained and even fixed, but this is really important. Otherwise, like bugs will happen and you will learn about them. You want to learn when, what, wh why they happened, what went wrong. You will learn uh, how you fix them, and more, more importantly, you don't know what like, or at least your team will know what plans you have in place to prevent them from happening again. Uh, writing postmortem is a postmortem. Sorry, <laughs> postmortems is a really uh, important thing. We have benefited a lot from this at right. Uh, because that way, when something goes wrong, everyone knows exactly what happened and they know how to prevent, like how to, yeah, prevent that, those types of errors from happening to them too. So, 
another part of I mean the, the, the rest of the part of having a like contention a damage contention plan is are really like focused on something that I call like don't be not being a bottleneck so when dealing with payments in a few companies I've worked for I've, I've found that like because it, it's really normal for us as engineers to focus on what we know m the most about or what we like the most, mo mo yeah, the most. Uh, we end up like focusing or knowing more about specific parts of our system. So I found out that, I, f I have found out that, found out that there's, it's pretty common for someone in the company to be like the payment expert. And that's, that as we know, it's normally pretty bad. So let's see what you can do to uh, like make this less of a problem when a billing box or what, uh, sorry, a payment box arrives. So the first thing is like have kind of a handbook to deal with problems uh, so that anyone can deal with bugs uh, when that this expert in payments is not around. Uh, so you can include stuff such as like, how do I refund a user? How do I reverse a transfer? How can I recalculate a balance that's clearly off? Uh, also write documentation. Uh, documentation specifically focusing on the structure of your billing code, how it works and how it implements the business rules specific to your domain problem, to, to the domain of your problem. So doing a, a quick recap about the five things we talked about. We talked about doing asynchronous transactions, uh, about payment status flexibility, about allowing users to have full control of their payment information and delete their payment information whenever they want. Also, how to be better prepared to ship big changes and how to deal with bugs. So, all of this we saw how to prevent the three most common pitfalls and how to improve your user experience uh, in regards to payments, it's all pointing at one thing. Maybe one thing we started talking about and it's having your users trust. Uh, okay, I hope this was useful and interesting for you. Uh, this is, uh, kind of a compilation of a lot of things, as I said at the beginning of the talk, that I've dealt with and I've seen other people struggle with. So I hope this is useful. Uh, if it was, um, come and talk to me after the talk. I'll be here uh, both days. Don't be shy. Uh, or just tweet me and let's start a conversation over there. I love talking about payments because it's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So thanks a lot for listening.